Hey, Christy. Hey, Leslie. Why do chickens not like Hamlet? Why? Because they're scared of murder most foul. Ooh, let's stay on the Hamlet vein, shall we? <laughs> if Shakespeare wrote a prequel to Hamlet, what would you call it? I don't know. Piglet! <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you call a tiny pig reciting Shakespeare? <laughs> what? Hamlet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy, a backyard gardener from Colorado. These days, gardening has gotten very popular, and my friends and I have noticed more and more people picking our brains for tips and troubleshooting about gardening. We're not experts. We just learned a lot about gardening from the mistakes we made along the way. So welcome to Upside Down Tulips, a fun podcast that celebrates gardening gone wrong. Upside Down. Hello, Christy. Hello, gardeners. <laughs> and wannabe gardeners. And people who love William Shakespeare. That's right. We're doing Shakespeare. A Shakespeare's garden. You I know, love it. We're going to teach you all about how to do a Shakespeare's garden. And you may realize you may already have a partial Shakespeare's garden anyways. Exactly. Coming up, Leslie, kind of exciting. The first week in May is National Compost Week. So what do you do on National Compost Week? Do you, like, just throw out all your trash? What do you do? <laughs> that's right. That's right. You throw out all your trash. Um, yeah, you can turn your compost. You can start a compost pile. You turn it. That yeah. makes sense. And if you want to know more about composting, friends, you can... We have a whole episode on composting all the way back at episode 11, Compost Happens, How to Support the Gardens BF. Love it. Uh, Did you know in Denver, they're starting to give everyone compost bins? I love that. Yeah. So you can uh, you can go down. They, I mean, everybody gets one for free. Uh-huh. And you can go down and get one. My neighbors have one, so I secretly put things in there. Oh, do you really? Yeah, because like, we don't have one. Where do these banana peels come from? <laughs> exactly. We like don't drink coffee. Yeah. Bananas. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I did ask them once, and they said it was okay, but that was, oh, like, okay. that was like two years ago. So, you know. <laughs> um, May 15th. It's National Tulip Day. I love tulips. They're so pretty. Did you see my tulips when you came in today? Those big orange and pink tulips? Were they in the front? Yeah. I didn't see them. Well, these are the ones I got from Amsterdam, and they are stunning. Oh. Friends, I'll put a picture on Facebook about them. They are just abs- – they're so tall. Yeah. They're just beautiful. My friend Shannon is in Amsterdam right now with her mom, and she put up on Instagram just rows and rows and rows of tulips. They're well, so pretty. Now's the time for them. Um, when I was there, I just bought a ton, a ton of bulbs. Mm-hmm. Coming up on May 19th is National Plant Something Day. May 19th, plant something. Just uh, anything. I'm doing it. A house plant, a vegetable, a flower. Just plant something. I'll have plenty of things to plant. Plant your feet. <laughs> Oh, and Leslie, why will you have plenty of things to plant? Because of my winter sewing. So, friends, two weeks ago, we did winter sewing in the spring, and Leslie sewed a bunch of milk jugs. Oh. How's it going? Oh, it's just, it's so exciting when you see that first little tiny green thing poke through that dirt. You uh-huh. know? So, I put it in our front, um, our kind of on our porch in the front, uh-huh. which my husband does not like because he's like, it looks trashy. And I'm like, well, sometimes we have to do trashy things for right, our, have, for our plants. But, but you were storing the milk jugs underneath your bed. I know. So I felt like it was a better place for them to be. <laughs> but the cosmos was the first thing to come up. Oh, fun. And it was just so exciting. I just opened it up. Like it was, I couldn't have been more than a week. And there, it was just full just full. And then um, the flowers did, were fastest. Mm-hmm. You know, the zinnias came up and... Um, oh, good. Uh, I can't remember what the last one was. And but, I'm, I can I just say I'm really glad about your zinnias and your cosmos because those weren't seeds from a package. Those were seeds that I harvested from my yard, which means they don't they may not have as high a germination rate. So oh. that's good that they came up. Well, so they quick. were fast, 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 you know. And um the the slowest thing was the basil and uh the dill and the cilantro. So uh the basil started and it's packed. And right. I talked to my friend Kathy, you know, because my revenge basil. And Kathy's not even doing basil this year. She's oh. just she's having some work done in her backyard and she's like, Yeah, I, I I can't, you know, 
guarantee that they're going to be safe. And I was like, well, if you give me all your pots, I'll plant them for you. Cause I have so many. Oh, that's nice. Cause they're just popping up every day. Another one pops up and I love it. Oh, exciting. And, uh, then the, now, which was the seed that lays on top of the dill? Okay. Well, dill finally has come up. Okay. And I've got maybe, you know, it's not a lot, but it's mm-hmm. coming up. And then today when I watered them today, cause Got to keep them watered. They do dry out really fast. Especially this time of year. I almost do it every day. It's like I think I did every other day. Mm. Because it it's is, it's dry And it's already. getting warm out here in the Denver metro area. Yeah. For sure. So today was the very first cilantro that popped up. Hey. And it's just one right now. But at least I know it's working. It works. Yeah. It's, like, it's like Christmas, isn't it? I love it so much. Oh, and remember I told you about my um, rose bush that I was like, I think it's dead. Uh-huh. Well, I just put it outside. I'm like, it was in the window. And I'm like, I'm just going to put it outside and leave it alone. Made sure I watered it really uh-huh. good. Uh, like two days later, leaves everywhere. I mean, they just popped out. I was like, how did that happen in two days? It's because you no, you do not have a brown thumb. I just left you, it alone. You have to acknowledge the fact, <laughs> Leslie, that you have a green thumb now. Well, green-ish. Okay, uh, green-ish. you know, but but I I will I will take that. But I I literally just left it alone, it's, and yeah. it just all of a sudden, it's so exciting though. I just love it when you just see something growing uh-huh. and you're like, wow, I helped that. Will you somehow. take pictures of your I took chest? pictures. Oh, I good. have them we'll on my them, phone. We'll I will Facebook. give them to you before I leave. Okay. Do you want to hear the list of what I have germinating in my yes. milk jugs? All righty. Um, I have foxglove, hollyhocks, black-eyed Susan, echinacea, calendula, morning glory, petunia. Those are my flowers. I love that. Then I have, for herbs, I have dill, Marjoram, and for veggies, I have celery, tomato, pumpkin, and cauliflower all have germinated. That's awesome. And I'm waiting on watermelon. Watermelon! I'm, I'm doing a little experiment. Now, I know it sounds crazy to do watermelon in Denver, but I think I have a little breed that's it's a tiny little watermelon. Like, you know those little dulcineas? Oh, I love those. So maybe that'll be okay. And I'm waiting on um, peppers. <gasps> Love peppers. And peppers take a while to germinate. I once did this, Leslie, that I thought, well, they didn't work, right? So I thought, well, I'm just going to winter sow something else. So in the same container that I had the peppers, I winter sowed some Cosmos. And sure enough, they both came up at the same time. (laughs) And they were so intertwined, I couldn't really take them apart. And they were too, it was a fail experiment because both of them were unhappy. So I'm going to be patient and wait on my peppers. And then I also have some, maybe perhaps some fail experiments. I try to... I tried to sow some seed that I had collected from my red bird in a tree, oh. which is this lovely little perennial plant that actually looks like, the blooms look like little baby red birds in a tree, not germinating. Oh. And my butterfly weed, not germinating, but maybe I'll have something different to say in the next episode. I'm telling you, you never know. Right? My cilantro popped up today. That's, you know what else is really popping up in my yard? Weeds. Weeds. Oh, I hate weeds. Oh my gosh. There are so many dandelions. Um, and it's folks, as you I know there are some folks out there that say save your dandelions because it's the first food for bees. But I feel like I have enough food for bees because I have grape hyacinths and daffodils and tulips and crocuses and hyacinths. So I pull my dand they're all they're they are they came with a vengeance this year. I have those ones that are those pokey ones oh, that I have hate like those. thorny things sticking yeah, out. Maybe you know, it's Canada worst. thistle. It's the worst. Yeah. Uh, So many weeds. And then creeping bellflower. I have a lot of that coming up. Uh, I I can't believe how much in a week all the weeds have come up. I know. It's crazy. And then I have to tell you this story. I'm I'm so late, Leslie, in my cleaning my, doing my spring cleaning. I'm so late. I still have beds I haven't cleaned out. (laughs) And, you know, you think about like some of the spring cleaning friends is, you know, you use a rake, but a lot of it, at least in my experience, is you're on your hands and knees. Yes. Hands and knees, which is, you know, and pulling stuff away. And so usually I'm listening to a a true crime podcast or a garden podcast while I'm doing it. I'm just kind of go to my happy place and I'm just cleaning, 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 not really thinking about it. I reached and I thought I grabbed what was a bunch of leaves and I had grabbed a dead bird. <gasps> no. And it just scared the crap out of oh. me. And so I like, I flung it and I stood up and I kind of squealed about it. Right. And, and it was a freshly dead bird cause it, it looked pretty good still. And so I thought, okay. And I kind of like shook that off and I, Kind of took my rake and I kind of put it in a spot 
for my handsome and handy husband to take care of yes. later, right? <laughs> and then I go back and I'm cleaning, 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 and going to work. And I, you know what I did? Is I grabbed the same dead bird again. What? <laughs> oh, <laughs> again? I did it twice. <laughs> I grabbed that bird again. <laughs> I'm just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's still there. Oh. I haven't, yeah, I haven't gotten my, I, I have to get my handsome and handy husband to get that yeah. dead bird. But I'm almost done. Yeah, I haven't even started thing. mine. I haven't even started. Oh, good. You make me feel bad. I and my um lamb's ear uh -huh. is like now halfway into my grass. These these oh, little tiny shoots. Yeah, you know, I know they've what you got mean those, by those those vines that are, you know, those mm -hmm. roots that go underneath. I gotta I'm gonna have to pull them all out. Yeah, pull them all out. Yeah. yeah. And compost them because it's National Compost Week. I will. Okay, friends. If there are words or terms you don't understand, what do you do? Go to our website and look up the upside down dictionary and um, while you're there, check out all of our fun blogs that we have there. We'll, you'll find a link for that in our show notes, or you can go to UpsideDownTulips.com. We also have fun stuff on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest. Hey, do you want to support the podcast? I do. Why don't you become a member of Up the Upside Down Tulips Garden Party? Fantastic idea. Uh, all you need to do is uh, click on the link in the show notes and throw us a couple bucks a month. And depending upon what level you're in, we will send you uh, seeds from our gardens or maybe some merch like a coffee cup or a t-shirt. I have my coffee cup. If you want merch, also check on the link in our show notes. And coming up, we have a big Shakespeare theme this week. We have one of our oldies but goodies, Pop Play about William Shakespeare. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, sermons in stones, and good in everything. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. Will Shakespeare, quit being poetic and just weed the garden. Yes, Anne. I merely hold, as it were, the mirror up to nature. Just pull the weeds, Will. And don't pull up the beans like last time. Yes, Anne. To weed... Or not to weed? That is the question, whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the seeds and clutches of outrageous bindweed, or to take arms against a sea of weeds and by poisoning end them. Out, out, damned weed! Will, stop! That's the spinach. Oh. Sorry, Anne. Tough day in the garden. Have a cup of Calm Tom's high tea. No longer just for afternoon high tea in a pricey restaurant. Calm Tom's high tea is for any time in your very own kitchen. Calm Tom's high tea. Organic tea leaves, our love, and a little something extra goes into every tea bag. I think it's gonna rain, Will. Will you weed the corn before it does? Yes, Anne. <sighs> Once more onto the breach. <clears throat> oh, blow winds and crack your cheeks. Rage! By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Hail! You cataracts and hurricanes! Hail no more! You have drenched our green beans, battered the red tomatoes, and drowned the potatoes. No! <laughs> Cry woe, destruction, ruin, and decay. Will, get in here out of the storm. Come on, I'll make you some nice hot tea. And a poultice, please, for my battered head, and Ow. Oh, woe for the garden. It'll grow back, Will. All's well that ends well. Really tough day in the garden. Have a cup of Calm Tom's Very High Tea. No longer just for afternoon high tea in a pricey restaurant. Calm Tom's Very High Tea is for any time in the comfort of your own kitchen. Calm Tom's Very High Tea. Organic tea leaves, our love, and more than a little something extra goes into every tea bag. A William Shakespeare Garden. Leslie, you're going to be performing this summer. 
at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. I am. Which is kind of how we thought of this would be a fun topic to have. And what roles are you playing this summer? Um, so I'm doing The Winter's Tale and One Man, Two Governors, uh, which is a farce um, that is uh, kind of a modern british telling of A Servant of Two Masters. Uh, but in, you know, The Winter's Tale, which is a little known play, uh, people don't usually do it, but it's such a beautiful play. Um, I'm playing uh, Old Shepherd. Ah, typecast again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and a bunch of smaller parts, you know, ensemble uh, here and there. But I think it's going to be really fun. Well, um, if folks who don't know what a Shakespeare garden is, it's a themed garden that cultivates the 175 plants and trees that are mentioned in Shakespeare's plays. Wow. And we're going to talk about all 175. <laughs> no, we're not. Um, well, you know, Shakespeare grew up in a small town with gardens that was surrounded by meadows and a river and had forests and woodlands. And so he references trees and herbs and uh, kitchen plants and flower garden plants through all his plays. Um, he died in 1616. However, in 1631, there is reference that a man called Sir Thomas Temple of the first baronet of Stowe sent one of his folks for cuttings from the grapevines of the home of William Shakespeare's in Stratford-on-Avon. And that wow. seems to be the beginning of a Shakespeare-themed garden. Oh. 1616. Wow. Um and then there was the revival of interest in the flowers mentioned in Shakespeare's plays um, came about when the, there was a revival of flower gardening in the United Kingdom. And and the earliest document is from Paul Jared, Flowers from Stratford-on-Avon from 1852, which he attempted to identify all of the floral and plant references in Shakespeare plays in 1852. Wow. And there are some pretty famous Shakespeare gardens all over the world. Most famous being at Stratford-on-Avon. Of course. And um, the uh, royal family has a Shakespeare garden at their Q Palace, if you ever go there. Oh, and in of course Great we have Britain. one here in Colorado, right in our own backyard. One of the more famous ones at is the, in Colorado. And yep. it's beautiful. Yeah, it is at the Colorado Shakespeare Festival. And you can walk around the gardens and you can... Have a picnic there on the grasses. It's really And it's beautiful. right next door to the theaters where the mm -hmm. plays happen. That was founded in 1991. Oh, wow. It has 100 of the plants in Shakespeare's plays there. That's fantastic. Right on campus at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should talk about some of our favorite plants and flowers that are in Shakespeare's plays. And the most common plant or flower that Shakespeare mentions is the rose. Wow. Over 70 references. Wow. Uh, Leslie, give us a quote. So this is Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, this quote is spoken by Juliet just after she meets Romeo. And Juliet is unhappy because she has just learned that Romeo is a member of the family that is her enemy. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Well, you know, there are lots of roses that are named after Shakespearean characters. Oh, really? Yeah. There's a, one of the most famous rose makers is David Austin. And he there actually is a rose called the William Shakespeare. Really? Yeah. You could have that in your yard. I didn't know that. Um, there's, there's a Juliet. There's a Desdemona. There is a Troilus and a Cressida rose. There's a Mistress Quickly from Mary Wives. There's a Prospero, and there's an Amanda from The Tempest. Wow. Falstaff, and Ophelia. Oh, of course. This is Hamlet, Act 4, Scene 5. Ophelia has gone insane. Uh, she comes in, and she's handing out flowers while muttering and singing songs that don't make any sense. Uh, as she gives out the flowers, she mentions her father's death, and says that there are no more violets because he is dead. There's rosemary, that's for remembrance. Pray you, love, remember. And there's pansies, that's for thoughts. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's rue for you. And here's some for me. We call it herb of grace of Sundays. You must wear your rue with a difference. There's a daisy. I would give you some violets. But they were withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. 
So, of course, in the mad scene, I, you know, I'm not, can't do it, but, you know, she's handing all this stuff out. And each one of these has an actual, you know, meaning. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, of course, being one of the most beloved plants we talk about here on Upside Down Tulips. We had a whole episode dedicated to Rosemary. Um, it, episode 102, just a couple of months ago, uh, Rosemary, how to plant, grow, and not kill the dew of the sea. couple quick tips for folks who want to grow rosemary. Give it full sun. Uh, don't overwater it or overfeed it. Give it good drainage. And depending on the zone you live in, consider if you need to cover it in the winter or bring it in. Uh, we also recently just talked about pansies. Mm -hmm. That was episode 104, Perfectly Practical Tips About Peas and Other P Words from the Garden. And now is a great time to have pansies. I have pansies that I just planted all over my yard. They're best planted in the cool spring or in the fall. And they prefer sites with a full morning sun. But see if you can give them some shade in the intense afternoon heat because they do not like heat. Well, that's good to know. Uh, do you like fennel? I I really like fennel. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I've never seen it grow though. I mean, it's a big bulb, right? Yeah. I, I, well, I have grown it before. Most I just grow it for the fronds cause you can use the fronds and recipes. I, I've been unsuccessful growing the bulb. It just never seems to do much. Um, and if there are folks out there who have more success and tips on how to grow fennel, boy, we sure would like them. Um, but what I have heard is that it's important to keep fennel the soil consistently moist. Shout out to moist. Moist. And um, you're supposed to earth it up, which I love this because it uses the word earth as a verb, which I did not know it could be that way. But like potatoes, you're supposed to, as the plant grows, you're supposed to pile on the earth on top of the plant to keep it sturdy. Oh. And then it'll help the bulb get bigger and apparently keep it pale in color. Mm -hmm. But I tried that. I, it did not work. Um, I loved doing some research on this Ophelia model where it talks about rue. Yeah, what is that? Um, it is a short-lived perennial herb with a shrub-like growth habit. And it has like a blue-green leaves with a fern-like appearance. And in the summer, it'll have clusters of yellow flowers that will attract butterflies and other pollinators to your garden. Folks... Full sun, drainage, it's fairly drought tolerant and good for zone 4 to 10, which is pretty much the entire United States, oh. except for Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. We should all grow some rue. Yeah. Oh, she also talks about, um, she says, there's a daisy, right? Uh, daisies, I have to say, are one of my favorite flowers. Yeah, they're so pretty. Um, the, and these are fast growing flowers, so make sure if you plant them in your garden um, to give them room because they will grow pretty quickly. Uh, a tricky little tip about daisies, which I don't do, is you're supposed to be very cautious about watering them at the base of the plant, which is true for all plants. We always say water the toes and never the nose. But my daisies get hit by the sprinkler, so they get watered on top, Which, but they don't like that. So that's why my daisies are always very droopy. Um, and then finally, oh, in this speech, she talks about violets. Oh, Yeah. Uh, one of the more common flowers also mentioned in Shakespeare's uh, plays and a very popular plant uh, during the, not, not only just during the Tudor era, um, but also during the Victorian era. Violets were used for their, uh, for medicinal purposes. They were used in recipes and they can be planted in the spring or the fall, though spring is usually the best. So folks, plant some violets right now. Um, they enjoy a light shade, but you could put them in some sun and they tolerate most, uh, soil types, but they usually prefer it when it's moist, moist. and well-draining and rich in organic matter. We'll come back. Let's talk about some more Shakespeare quotes. I love some it. Some more Shakespearean plays, but let's have another Shakespeare pop play. <laughs> Oh, that this too, too solid ice would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew. Oh, God. Oh, God. How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this garden. Fie on it. Oh, fie. Tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely. Hamlet? 
It's winter in Denmark. Of course the ground is frozen solid. But two months dead, Ophelia. Zone 9, Hamlet. It happens every year. Oh, most pernicious woman. Oh, villain. Villain smiling. Damn it, villain. I don't control the seasons. To weed or not to weed. That is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous bindweed or to pull them out. This weed of troubles and, by thus doing, end them. Nobody weeds in the winter because it's pointless. The ground is frozen. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth. Then, oh God, I'll seed. Ophelia, get thee to a nursery and procure me some seeds. Get thee to a nursery. Go. Farewell. To a nursery go and quickly too. Hamlet. You get like this every winter when you can no longer garden. Look, here's something you wrote to me last summer. I'll read it to you. What a piece of work is a garden. How noble the gardener. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving, how express and admirable. In action, how like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god. The beauty of the world. Give it a little while, Hamlet. The garden will be back. All right, Ophelia. Let's go sit by the brook. Yes, let's do. I love the brook. Poor Ophelia. Poor Ophelia. You know, we were talking about the daisies. Uh Uh-huh. And uh, daisies signified pure virginity. Which works so well for our sweet, poor Ophelia. Yes. Stop hanging around that brook with Hamlet. It's not going to end well for you, my dear. (laughs) No. (laughs) Actually, that's one of my favorite parts is when, um, you know, when Gertrude, because we we hear about her death from Gertrude. Uh Uh-huh. Because she comes in and tells Laertes that um, she's drowned. Uh, She says, one woe doth tread upon another's heel. So fast they follow. Your sister's drowned, Laertes. And he says drowned oh where and then she starts to tell her that you know it's at the brook but i love the part where she says uh there with fantastic garlands did she come of crow flowers nettles daisies and long purples Mm. that liberal shepherds give a grosser name but our cold maids do dead men's fingers call them and I thought that was so interesting. You know, crow flowers. That's such a great name. But, I've never you know, heard of those before. Nettles, daisies, long purples. Well, yeah. I was dying to know what a long purple was. Um, and um, it says long purples were likened to dead men's hands or fingers. That's mm. why they called them long purples. Um, but they were early purple orchids. Wow. That's what it stands for. And I also loved crow flowers. Uh-huh. I didn't know what that was. And it said uh, they were known as Fair Maid of France. That was another name for crow flowers. And they were a kind of campion. Oh, gotcha. Because they are like a like a nettle, aren't they? They have they look like they have like little um they almost like look like little cactuses, don't they? Uh, I actually yeah. don't know what a oh, campion okay. looks like. Okay. <laughs> um, but they do mention nettles, mm-hmm. and this had a particularly specific meaning of being stung to the quick, and oh. that means, you know, deeply or emotionally hurt, which, of course, we know. Yes. Ophelia was... Deeply and emotionally hurt. Deeply with, and emotionally hurt. With crow hurt. flowers. Mm-hmm. Oh, wonderful. Well, in honor of you being in Winter's Tale, Leslie... Oh, could you give us some Winter's Tale with flowers in it? Oh, they do. Uh, There is a little section in Winter's Tale where uh, Perdida is the mistress of the feast, and she's playing hostess at the sheep shearing festival. Fun. uh, When King Polixenes and Camillo arrive in disguise, and she gives them flowers, accompanied by a uh, short little speech. And she says, "Give, give me those flowers there, Dorcas. Reverend sirs. So now she's talking to the... To these guests. Uh, For you, there's rosemary and rue. These keep seeming and savor all winter long. Mm. Grace and remembrance be to you both, and welcome to our shearing. I love that because rosemary is known for helping with your memory. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Really? 
Or maybe I told you when you forgot. Ah. <laughs> Actually, that seems probably more like it for me. <laughs> oh, give us some more Winter's Tale. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, uh, Perdida and Polixenes continue to argue about, oh, they argue about crossbreeding flowers. Because mm. Perdida, she prefers to have flowers that are pure, um, that haven't been influenced mm -hmm. by the art of grafting, that she calls it. And Polixenes, of course, sees that there's nothing wrong with crossbreeding flowers to produce a nobler breed that he says... Um, and uh, she she has a little uh, thing that she says, here's flowers for you, hot lavender, mints, savory, marjoram, the marigold that grows to bed with the sun and with him rises weeping. Beautiful. So lavender, um, a couple little tip, quick tips on lavender. Folks, I highly recommend you get an English lavender and not a French lavender because an English lavender is a bit more hearty, especially if ah. you're in our neck of the woods, the Denver metro area. Lavender like sun, good drainage, and now is the time to prune it. So even though I've been doing all my spring cleanup, I haven't touched my lavender until I start seeing the growth come back on it. And now I have to go out and prune it. Oh, also it talks about mints too, right? Mints? Mm -hmm. uh, you I love have tried mint. to grow mint. I cannot get it to grow at my house. <laughs> what is wrong with me? <laughs> because once you get it established, as people will notice, is that mint can be quite invasive. You know, like you were saying, you're... Lamb's ear will get into the lawn. Mm -hmm. I have apple mint growing in my lawn that I have to yank out. Oh. Because it, it sends out little trailers and then jumps up someplace else. Um, well, um, now is a great time to plant it after Mother's Day for most folks around the country. Um, and, and maybe, Leslie, make sure you put it in partial shade. Plant it under a tree. Oh. It, might, it does like a little shade, so maybe that would be my suggestion to you. Oh, I think I did plant. I think you gave me some. Uh -huh, and I, I did, think I yeah. did plant it, but it was right in the front, so it would have gotten some uh, all day. Well, yeah. Yeah, it did, never even took <laughs> at all. Oh, uh, well. And sometimes things don't transplant well, Leslie, so give yourself a break. Mm, okay. Well, and it also mentioned that marigold. Marigold was the third one of my winter sewing that I couldn't remember because, oh, you know, it was Cosmo, Zinnia, and marigolds. And that, did that come up? Totally came up. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, now, friend, this is a great time. To see. You can still winter sew marigolds. I haven't even started mine yet, but I'm still going to do it. Marigolds love full sun. Uh, you should avoid fertilizing marigolds. No. Because if you fertilize them, you'll get a lot of green leafy stuff, but not as much flower. Oh. Um, and don't forget to deadhead your marigolds, and you'll keep getting blooms all summer long. And that means by pinching off the mm -hmm. spent flowers. You're supposed to do that with roses too, right? Yes. Okay. I do. Yeah. In fact, I deadhead. Uh, you, there are many flowers that you can deadhead, and you'll get a. You'll keep getting them, especially annuals. Okay. But roses too, if you deadhead those. Um, let's see. You also talk about. Savory and marjoram, two of my favorite herbs. What is savory? It's a very wonderful little herb. Savory is uh, likes full sun, well-drained, and actually it's okay if you give it a rather poor soil. It's hardy that way. And it's good to keep savory trimmed back. Um, otherwise, it gets pretty leggy. And marjoram likes full sun, and um, but also likes it slightly dry, so careful of overwatering your marjoram. So, Leslie, how many times have you been in a Midsummer Night's Dream? How many times? I think it's three or four. The first time I did it, I did it in college, and I played Cobweb. Well, I the first time I was in a Midsummer Night's Dream, I did it in college, and I thought I was Cobweb, and I looked it up, and I was, been, I was wrong. You were wrong? I was wrong. I was Moth. Moth. I don't even remember moth. Oh, no. <laughs> My mom said I was really good, Leslie. Oh, that's good. <laughs> oh, will you read us some Midsummer Night's Dream? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, well, of course, flowers are very heavily in Midsummer Night's Dream, especially with the flowers that Oberon and Puck use to uh, make the lovers fall in love Um uh, but Oberon says, uh, one of his speeches is, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. 
There sleeps Titania sometimes of the night, lulled in these flowers with dances and delight. Ah, time. Folks, I hope you grow time. I grow time. Um, and you know what a good little tip about time is? Is it goes really well in containers. Again, another reference to Violet. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tudor housewives used Violet for candy making, baking, conserving, and making syrups. And they even used it for cosmetics. Really? Uh, woodbine. Oh, I loved this about woodbine. Friends, woodbine is a species of vines belonging to a number of flowering plant families, a.k.a. Virginia creeper, which some people consider to be an invasive vine, <laughs> woodbine. Um, musk roses, guess what this is? It's a rose that has a musky odor. Really? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, I forgot to talk about oxlips. It's similar to a cowslip that we would know, or in other words, a primrose oh. from our world. And um, eglantine is another way of saying the sweet briar rose, which is Shakespeare's favorite rose. It has little pink flowers, and it also has very colorful rose hips that give the plant additional fall and winter interest. And it thrives in alkaline soils, which is very common in Colorado. Oh, that's cool. Rose hips. Now, I've heard that that's I, – I, I had a friend who's um, – Mother would make like a tea. Yeah, you can. Absolutely. Yeah, like a rose hips tea. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't remember what she used it for, but it was some kind of medicinal. And not all roses will have them. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the after effect of the oh. flower. It'll be left with a little, mm-hmm. little something nummy. Oh, oh, I think we have time for a little bit of Mary Wise of Windsor. Okay. Uh, in Merry Wives of Windsor, there's a reference to bachelor's buttons. Uh, your love life will last as long as the button in your lapel. Mm. Um, and so one of the little speeches is, what say you to young Master Fenton? He capers, he dances, he has eyes of youth, he writes verses, he speaks holiday, he smells April and May, he will carry it. He will carry it. Tis in his buttons. He will carry it. That means his love life is going to be long, right? Exactly. I have bachelor buttons right next to my vegetable garden. And what I'd like to do with them is because they will reseed and actually end up in my vegetable garden. This time of year, I pluck them out and I move them to where I want them to be. If you do it early on in the season, uh, you can have control over reseeding bachelor buttons. Well, what does a bachelor button look like? It looks like a little baby carnation. Oh, it'll, it'll be of course, cut. in your lapel. There you go. Carnations in the lapel. That makes total sense. Let's do some more serious stuff. How about Henry the Fourth, Part One, Leslie, Act Two, Scene Four? Uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One, Act Two, Scene Four. Harry, I do not only marvel where thou spendst thy time, but also how thou art accompanied. For though the chamomile, the more is trodden on. The faster it grows, yet youth, the more it is wasted, the sooner it wears. A great speech by Falstaff, where he is comparing the delicate stage of youth to the seemingly delicate flower of chamomile. And he's kind of saying, like, the more you tread on chamomile, the faster it grows. But youth is not like that. And the more you waste youth, the quicker it disappears. And therefore, youth is even more delicate than Chamomile. Um, There are two different types of chamomile. German and Roman, both types boast these little tiny fragrant flowers. And you could use that whole flower for tea. Fresh, dried, either way. Throw it in a teapot and have chamomile tea. You don't have to do anything to it. You literally just throw it in and heat it up. Yeah, and you got tea. Taming of the Shrew, Leslie. This is Taming of the Shrew. Act four, scene four, and Biandello tells Lucentio to get to the church as soon as possible uh, and to make sure he has some reliable witnesses to confirm the marriage. I cannot tarry. I knew a wench married in an afternoon as she went to the garden for parsley to stuff a rabbit, and so may you, sir. (laughs) Parsley, a wonderful plant. Um, You know, it's a biannual plant, parsley is. 
So perennial plants grow back each year and annual plants die after one season. Um, so it's always good to continually sow parsley. It breaks my heart when I have to buy parsley in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And my parsley plant is looking kind of pathetic. So I'm going to have to sow some parsley seeds <laughs> this week. So parsley, if you want to, I mean, because I see dried parsley all the time. Mm -hmm. So can you dry, you can dry your own? That's right. Yeah. I have to say, I have to confess that my dried parsley doesn't really turn out that well. Oh. But, you know what I love about this, Leslie, is I didn't realize how many Shakespearean plants I have in my garden already. It's fantastic. And I love the scrapbooking idea. And so I hope folks that are listening will go see some Shakespeare in their communities this summer and then scrapbook some plants in their yard. Um, if you live in Colorado, you can go to uh, the Colorado Shakespeare Festival up in Boulder, or you can also go to Shakespeare in the Wild because your husband's in it this summer, right, mm -hmm. Leslie? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I think he auditioned. Okay. Um, and that's As You Like It. In, in Centennial. Mm -hmm, at Goodson Park. And then there's also the, the Denver Center for the Performing Arts, the Shakespeare in the parking lot. I just saw that today. Nice. How yes. was it? It was so good. It was uh, my, uh, I live near Cook Park and they were doing it in the parking lot of Cook Park. So oh, fantastic. We went over and saw it. It was terrific. There's also down south in Colorado Springs, uh, they do Shakespeare in a at tent. Theater, at theater, theater works. works. Yeah. I think they're doing Taming of the Shrew. But it's going to be real crazy. It's all gender swapped and it's going to be really cool. Awesome. Where hast thou been, sister? I am a boil. Killing swine. And look here, I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. Oh my! Double, double, double toil and, and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Thrice the brindled cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Tis time, tis time. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Round about the cauldron go. In the poisoned entrails throw. Toad that under cold stone days and nights has 31. Swelt red venom sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Yes, yeah, so wicked. Tis the cold virus that has infected our dear witch sister Miasma. No, Esma Pus. The wicked thing that comes, and that this brew is for, is Macbeth, future Thane of Cawdor. No, it isn't. This brew is for our snot-strangled sister, poor congested miasma. This brew is a cure for the common cold, culled from vegetables and herbs from my garden. See how I add the garlic, rosemary, and sage. Classic herbs for colds and sore throats. Both are known for their antimicrobial and antiviral properties. Rosemary is said to stimulate the circulatory system and thus is thought to encourage blood flow to the brain to relieve headaches. And a chicken, killed most mercifully in her sleep. What has happened to you, Esma Pus? We're not physicians, we're witches! What has happened to you? Scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, which is mummy, ma, and gulp of the raven, seat, salt, shark. Stop it! I'm a boil. Stop turning this into an evil brew for black magic charms. I'm trying to make a chicken and vegetable garden soup. No! Filet of a fenny snake oh. in the cauldron, boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog. No! Not newt eyes. Nobody likes newt eyes. Ignoring you. Wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm sting. Lizard's leg and owlet's wing. Not the wing of a baby owl. I'm a boil. You're awful. Of course I'm awful. I'm a witch. Owlet's wing for a charm of powerful trouble. Like a hell broth boil and bubble. Double, double toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Parsnips and carrots, onions and parsley. Well, there you go. You ruined it. 
can't put parsnips in a black magic brew. I know that I'm a boil. And I can't serve a healing soup with an owlet's wing in it. So this whole cauldron is ruined. We might as well just dump this out right now. No. We'll put it in my compost pile. I don't even think you're a witch anymore. Never mind that. Grab the cauldron. To the compost pile we go. Uh, uh, Hey, I'm carrying most of the weight here. Why do I have the heavy end? It's a round pot, I'm a boil. There is no heavy end. I've got some eucalyptus, by the way, for my asthma's cold. Oh, I'm a boil. You're not all bad after all. I know it. Don't tell anybody. Come on. I won't. Leslie, guess what time it is? What time is it? It's mailbag time. Ring, ring. Now, we've got a fun letter for everybody, folks, because this is from our friend, Chad from Denver, who's written in several times discussing his forsythia plant. And he is, if you folks can remember, he's also written us some beautiful poems about his forsythia plant, Forsooth O Forsythia. And a forsythia plant is a wonderful little shrub That is one of the first bushes to bloom in the spring with bright canary yellow flowers. And last week I talked about how I was worried about my forsythia, Mm -hmm. worried that it was dead. Dead. And I wrote to him and he wrote back. So here's from Chad from Denver. Hi, Christy. Well, I went out and checked today. Our forsythia is looking pretty much like it did all winter. Lots of brown leaves. There are a few little green leaves sprouting on the branches, but no buds in sight as yet. It's been pretty cold, or at least chilly, the past few days, but we're seeing other things sprouting, even blooming. Here's to you and upside-down tulips and all. Here's to our Forsythia's uh, our Forsythia's fry thriving. That is hard to say. It is hard to say. <laughs> Here's to our Forsythia's. I can't even say it. I can't say it now, Chad. That was crazy that you wrote that. Uh, I'm going to skip that. And here's a haiku I wrote about mine a few years ago. Cold for April. Last year, the Forsythia bloomed in March. Cheers, Chad. Well, I have an update, Leslie, on my Forsythia. Really? Well, t- two weeks ago, I was singing, it's dead, it's dead. <laughs> and friends, Leslie and I went out and I showed her it, and we saw a little peak of green at the bottom. And I'm thinking, what is that? Is that a weed? What is that? And I learned something, and this is also because of my roses, is that my forsythia died back, but it's still alive. Really? So all we had the, a pretty severe frost yeah. series in the Denver metro area, and not only did my forsythia die back, but it's still alive, but my, ro- my climbing roses... And my rose bush, my peace rose, all died back, so all the green is at the bottom. So it's going to be a peony rose year and a pathetic forsythia year. But the good news is they're not dead. Not dead. They're going to Not come. dead. Not dead. Not dead. Well, friends, if you have questions, comments, observations, please write to us at UpsideDownTulips.com or at UpsideDownTulips.com. At Gmail. Here's to our Forsythia's thriving. Perfecto. Christy, after that tongue twister letter, I feel I need some inspiration. (laughs) Well, let's have some Shakespearean inspiration, don't you think, Leslie? I think it's totally appropriate. This is from Henry IV, Part Two. And it it reminds me of all the weeds I have in my garden right now. (laughs) Now tis spring, and weeds are shallow-rooted. Suffer them now, and they'll o'ergrow the garden. Yes. I like the shallow roots. I gotta pull them out now. Pull up those weeds now, friends. Otherwise, they're gonna be monsters come June. (laughs) Well, Leslie, we did it. We did Shakespeare's garden. Yay! And friends, you have reached the end of another wonderful episode of Upside Down Tulips. We are 
Christy Montour Larson, and the ever wonderful Leslie O'Carroll. And if you had some laughs and some value out of this week's episode, could you do us a favor? Please hit that subscribe, like, or follow button wherever you're listening to your podcast. See it there? Punch it. And thank you so much to Denise Gentilini for composing and performing the Upside Down Tulips theme song. If you want more, just go to denisegentilini.com or you can find that link at UpsideDownTulips.com. Thanks to the many talents and the kind hearts of Benjamin Bonifant, Jamie Ann Romero, Jason Maxwell, and Edith Edith Weiss. Weiss. Join us in two weeks for another episode that will delight and hopefully amaze you. And don't forget, if you make a mistake, your garden will forgive you. Upside down. Did you know a rowdy William Shakespeare walked into a pub and the landlord said, Out! You're barred! (laughs) 